The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... My grandmother was a great one for precepts and proverbs. One of many I remember is, He that doth what he will, doth not what he ought. That was grandma's warning against willfulness. The amazing lengths to which perversity can lead you is the extraordinary mystery by Mr. A. Conan Doyle. About to begin. Edwin, you see before you one of the finest young actors in America. Myself. And I'm getting rich. Oh, really? You've been acting on the stage in New York? <laughs> Not exactly. You see, Edwin, I'm very good at disguises. So I act our little part. I'm a young Englishman, a college student, what have you, to induce gentlemen of means to play cards with me. Card playing. That's where the money is. <laughs> mystery drama, The Cabinet of the Unsolved, is adapted from a story by Conan Doyle, especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis, and stars Robert Dryden. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. the cause of woe. Perversity, pig-headedness, obstinacy, all these principles of evil can lead a young man down a path from which there is no turning or returning. We are all born into this world the same way, but the roads we choose are too often our undoing, to which Inspector John Hilliard of Scotland Yard can well testify. a display cabinet at the yard marked unsolved. In it are items of clothing, weapons, empty bottles of poison, a parasol, even a pocket Bible. Evidence still insufficient to bring the guilty of various crimes to justice. I had in my hand a letter just received, which at long last might be the key to solving the Manchester Express murder. A case which began in London's Euston Station at half past four o'clock one blustery March afternoon. Are you taking the Manchester Express, sir? Yes, we are. First class coach, please. Are you the train guard? I am. If you and your lady will follow me, I'll find your compartment. Oh, one that is empty, if you please. My wife doesn't wish to be disturbed during the journey. I will if I can. But the five o'clock in Manchester is generally crowded. Here we are. Hey, let's try this compartment door, shall we? Oh, oh. I'm sorry, sir. I'm looking for a vacant compartment for this lady and gentleman. That was a smoking compartment. That man in there was smoking a cigar. The lady cannot abide smoking. We'll give it another try. If we have to look sharp, the train's about to leave. Oh, this one is vacant, sir. May I hand you up your Gladstone bag? No, never mind. Well, in you go, madam. You'll have the entire compartment to yourselves. Now, you, sir. You sure you don't want to hand with that bag? I said no. Now, shut the door. Mopey! Mopey! The station is Mopey! Hey, thank you, I'm... The train's five minutes late. We'll make it up before she pulls into Manchester. I say that, you know, that one of your compartment doors is open. Right behind you there. Uh, one in first class. Huh? Did someone just get off? Not at all. This door was open when you rose rolling in. Hey, let's have a look, huh? Uh, that's strange. There was a man with a cigar in there, Houston. Uh, nobody in here now. A short, red-faced man with a black beard smoking a big cigar. 
Well, that's why I put the gentleman and lady in the next compartment. Oh, well, it's our scam. Perhaps they know something. Oh, my lord. Will you look at this? Is he dead? There's a hole where the heart is. A bullet hole, I warn you. Oh, lying there. Such a young fellow. Did he get on at Houston? Well, not to my knowledge. I've never seen this unfortunate young man before. As I say, I, I know I put a gentleman and a lady in his compartment. Are you quite sure, Jim? A lady? Well, look up there over your head. What do you see? A lady's parasol. Oh, you're taller than I am. Would you reach it down from the luggage rack? Oh, yes, yes. That's the parasol she was carrying. Huh. Three missing persons and a corpse. Well, I can't let the train go on to Manchester now. Oh, you're right. Yeah. What you going to say, Jim? Well, not to expect the express to be on time today. And right quick to get on to Scotland Yard. That was how I got into the case. Three hours later, I was in Maltby. I identified myself as from Scotland Yard and found Jim Sloan, the Manchester Express train guard. He took me to the scene of the crime. Well, there's your body, Inspector, here. Just as uh, the Morby station master and I found it. We haven't touched the thing. Mm -hmm. I'd say the bullet penetrated the heart at close range. Death must have been instantaneous. All right, let's have a go through the man's pockets. Oh, goodness. Look at this, Mr. Sloan. Two gold watches in his waistcoat. He has another watch in his ticket pocket. Oh, is there a ticket, Inspector? Uh, I haven't run across it yet. Another watch in the breast pocket. Oh, that's not all. Look here. This leather strap round his left wrist. There's a watch there also. Six watches. Oh, well, I'd venture to say this man was a pickpocket. Mm, that might explain it. On the other hand, no... No. These two watches are American make. So is this one. Ah, they all are. Rochester Watch Company. Mason Watches, Elmira, New York. Ah. Well, now we're finding a few interesting items. A small circular mirror. A silver box with matches. One brown leather cigar case. Hmm. And I'd say whatever led to the young gentleman's death, the motive was certainly not robbery. And no railway ticket? No ticket. And as far as I can see, back of his shirt, inside his jacket, no marking or labels whatsoever. The two you put in here, what luggage did they carry on at Euston Station? In London? Well, let's see, the gentleman carried a large gladstone and... Oh, he was quite definite about not letting me handle it. And the lady, all she had was that parasol there. Ah, yes, on the seat. Is that where you found it? Oh, uh, no. No, I'm sorry, we did move it. The station master took it down from the luggage rack at my request. I'm, oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, will you be needing me any further, Inspector? Mm. Oh, yes, yes. But I'll have the yard notify the Northern Railway people that I want you to remain here in Maltby. There'll be an inquest and we shall need your evidence. Is Inspector Elliot here? Ah, yes, Coroner Willoughby. We are ready to give evidence at this inquest. Thank you, Inspector. Will you lead off? Uh, we of the yard have concluded that a crime has been committed. Assault and murder... We found no weapon in the compartment. Oh, yes. That disposes of any suicide theory. Quite. Inspector, we have a report here concerning the weapon used. From the bullet obtained in the deceased, it appears to be of small caliber, fired at fairly close range. Do you confirm this? Absolutely. Anything to add, Inspector? Mm, at this point, only pure speculation. Sir? The question of how or why three passengers could leave a moving train, one of them getting on the train during the run between London and Maltby. I plan to go into that, Inspector. 
You may step down, sir. Will the train guard, James Sloan, please step forward? Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Coroner. Oh, present. Regarding the inspector's speculation, do you have anything to add? Oh, you mean you'd like me to repeat what I told you before the inquest began? If you would be so kind. Well, the Manchester Express does make one very brief stop before Maltby. And where is that? Uh, at Mummy's. Oh, to put on some mail. And, uh, Mr. Sloan, did you see anyone get on or off the train at Monmouth? Well, I didn't, but I was fairly occupied loading the mail. Well, the express make no other stops before you reach Motby? No, sir. They... Oh, there's one spot where we slow up between uh, Pettisford and Chelney. Oh, we're making repairs there on the tracks. At that point, we lower our speed to eight, nine miles an hour. Well, would you say, Mr. Sloan, that at that place it might be possible for a man or even for a particularly active woman to have left the train without serious injury? Well, I would say it was possible, yes, sir, Mr. Corner. Of course, perhaps not unobserved, sir. Well, who could have seen them? Well, Pettis Ford is an hour out of London. We... Left Houston at five, that will make it six-ish. It's possible, uh, possible the railroad gang or plate layers might still have been working there. Oh, uh, Mr. Corner, may I have something here? Well, certainly. You are the station master in Maltby, isn't it so? Yes, sir. I spoke to the foreman of the railroad gang, but they saw nothing. Oh, so it's the view of you, gentlemen, I take it, that someone might have Jumped off the train on scene, or jumped on. Uh, Coroner, that is our view as well. At six o'clock or so, it is fairly dark this time of year. There's probably an embankment. Uh, oh, yes, sir. Right, right along there, sir. A steep embankment. Uh, which could have served to screen anyone from sight. Uh, may I suggest, Coroner, that we recess this hearing until I've had the opportunity to actually walk the distance between our... Uh, where did you say the two spots were, Sloan? Uh, Pettis, Ford, and Chelney. Ah, yes. It is also quite possible that along that route we may discover the murder weapon. Ah. How far have we come, Sloan? Well, I'd say from down here, Inspector, uh, checking the markers on the tracks up there... We walk a bit over three miles. Another mile or so, we'll, we'll be at Paddy's fault. Uh, we've been walking quite the reverse of the direction the express took, right? Going due south. Oh, yes, Inspector. Where we started walking at Tony is where the Manchester Express again picks up its normal speed. Now, in about a hundred yards or so is where the train slows up for the track gang. Ah, well, we... Haven't run across them. Oh, well, no. It's Sunday, sir. Nobody works on Sunday. <laughs> so it is. You keeping your eyes open, Sloan? Oh, indeed I am, sir. If there's a gun lying somewhere along here, it won't escape me. Uh, wait a minute. What's this? Oh, it's a pocket Bible, sir. Well, well, well. Uh, what's it say inside? Ah... Uh, Printed by the Bible Society, London. Aha. Uh -huh. To my beloved Mary, on our wedding day. But the date is obscured, smudged. Mm. Under that, for Michael from Mary, August 10th, 1865. And then a third inscription, for Edwin from his loving father. No date. All first names. Oh, it's too bad. Oh, why is that, sir? This Bible might belong to anybody. No way of identifying to whom it belongs. Oh, well, let's keep on walking. Well, well, Inspector, look there. Those, those marks on that big flat rock. Ah. Oh. Sloan, I think you found something... Is it there? Uh... I wouldn't take an oath on it, but those stains are not very old. Someone was badly hurt here. I'd say those marks 
our blood. Nothing can be more frustrating to students of sleuthing than mysterious disappearances. Couple that with a corpse that rode a train without a ticket, and you've got reason for a lot of head-scratching by Inspector John Hilliard. Does he come up with splinters or solutions? Wait and see when we return with Act Two. Remember the old saying, for want of a nail, the shoe is lost. For want of a shoe, the horse is lost. For want of a horse, the rider is lost. What does that tell us? Don't overlook the tiniest detail. It is that ability to probe and to question that has made Inspector Hilliard his reputation. And sometimes you add up two and two and four is not the answer. Inspector Hilliard. Are you prepared for the resumption of our inquest into murder discovered in a first-class compartment of the Manchester Express? I am, and I am not. Aren't we being a little cryptic, Inspector? Coroner Willoughby, we found no identification or manufacturer's labels on the garments worn by the deceased. No papers, some money, a strange, small, circular mirror... And six American pocket watches. Well, have you any theory how the deceased came to be inside the train compartment and yet apparently not visible when the train guard let in the gentleman and the lady? Yes, I have. He could have been concealed under the seat, which leads me to the second part of the theory. After the train left Euston Station in London, choosing to remain where he was... Possibly the deceased overheard some secrets which were of such a guilty nature that the man and woman dragged the victim from his hiding place and killed him. You put the death then down to an accident of meeting? Not the means. That was quite deliberate. But it is hardly likely the three could have met in that compartment by design since Mr. Slow and the train guard was the one who opened the door of the compartment for them. The compartment he had intended them to occupy was taken by a gentleman smoking. A gentleman who at this point is also missing. Ah, quite. Inspector Hilliard, I understand you've found a pocket Bible and traces of what may be blood on a stone during your examination of the train embankment. Ah, yes, yes we have. Uh, But so far as I can see at present, there's no connection with your coroner's inquiry here. The small Bible could have been dropped there by anyone. And even if the stains are identified as human, where would that lead us? I agree. Insufficient evidence to be meaningful to the purposes of this inquest. Anything else? I'm afraid not at this time. In view of that, Inspector, we would have no reason to alter or amend the coroner's verdict of murder by a person or persons unknown. Which brings us up to date. There, right before me, was the yard display cabinet representing crimes unsolved. Filled with what the Maltby coroner had said was insufficient evidence to be meaningful. The parasol, the pocket Bible, the small mirror, the watches, the bullet taken from the deceased, but no gun, no fingerprints, no culprit... In short, no case. That is, until this morning, when I received this letter in my hand. Dear gentlemen of Scotland Yard, the last time I was in London, I was particularly fascinated by your display cabinet in the main hallway marked Cases Unsolved. I would imagine the case of the the Manchester Manchester Express Express murder. murder. And whatever evidence you have collected is now in that cabinet. Perhaps after you've read this letter, you can mark that case solved. My people came from England, immigrating to the States in the 1850s, and settled in the town of Rochester, New York, where my father ran a dry goods store. We were only two sons, my younger brother, Timothy, and I. And one unfortunate day, out of the blue, my mother was stricken and died. My father, who loved her very much, 
went to pieces and suffered a stroke. Good morning, Father. How did you sleep? Uh, oh, oh, what time, what time is it? Oh, my goodness, I've overslept. Uh, the store. The doctor uh, said the best thing for you to do is rest and take care of your heart. Uh, my heart. She took it with her when she died. Uh, my beloved wife. Uh, Edwin, on the window seat is her little testament. The one she used to take to church. Uh, bring it here. Uh, I see it. I, I want you to have it, Edwin. Dearest Mary, we want you to have it. When we were first married, I, I gave it to her. Uh, never be without it. Do you promise? I promise. Not that you need prayers as much as your brother. That Timothy, that boy. Uh, you think you can take care of him? Of course I can, Father. Now, don't you worry about Timothy. Uh, and you remember, he's ten years younger than I am. And even though he's a senior in high school, I can still take him across my knee if he gets out of line. Uh, that's good. He's a wild boy. It's really about my younger brother, Timothy, that I'm writing you, gentlemen, of Scotland Yard. He barely got through high school by the skin of his teeth. And then suddenly... He left home and went to New York City. My father was never again able to get out of bed. He'd ask about Timothy and I'd make up stories about what a good job he had in the big city and so on. And then, one night... Timothy! Oh, come on in. Well, hello, Brother Edwin. I want you to meet my friend, Mac McGuire. Well, come in, both of you. Well, thank you. <laughs> you see, Mac? I told you we'd be welcome. Where well, have you been, Edwin? Aren't you going to ask after Father? Of course I will. How is he, by the way? Well, he's had two more heart shocks. I keep him in bed. Oh, I know how it is. My father had a coronary and passed on when I was quite young. Ours is still alive, but barely. No, he asks after you every day, Timothy. Of course, he has no idea what you're up to in New York City. And do you? Well, I have a pretty good idea. You sound like I was doing something criminal. Mac and I play cards. That's all we do. We give card-playing lessons. <laughs> You'd be surprised how much people will pay to learn that they have a lot to learn. Oh, no, Timothy. I want you to know, Edwin. Uh, may I call you Edwin? By all means. I try to take good care of Timothy here. Believe me, he's almost like a brother to me. I tell Edwin some of my accomplishments, Mac. Uh... Brother Edwin, you see before you one of the finest young actors in America. Myself. Really? Well, you've been acting on the stage in New York? <laughs> Not exactly. Oh, he is very good at disguises, your brother is. He acts out little parts, pretends to be different people in order to induce a gentleman of means to join in a game of cards. It's a lot more fun than being a storekeeper, Edwin. Why did you come back to Rochester? Oh, just to have a place to rest our weary bones until the heat's off. Well, some of your card-playing clientele didn't feel they got their money's worth, huh? Look, Brother Edwin, we didn't come here to be criticized. I don't like the tone of your voice. Well, let me remind you, Brother Timothy, I'm still ten years older than you are and a lot heavier. I can still give you one good thrashing. Now, you and Mr. McGuire are welcome to stay here for a time, but I warn you, Try any of your card sharpening tricks in this town, and I'll hand you over to the police so fast it'll make your head swim. Brother or no brother? Father wanted to see Timothy, so we went up to his bedroom. I'll say this. It did a lot for him. Timothy was always the favorite. But he and Mac McGuire hadn't been in town a week when I got a call from the police. Timothy had been arrested for passing a forged check. I said I was sorry, didn't I? Being sorry isn't good enough, Timothy. I needed the money. Mac and I had this 
pigeon all staked out. He was aching for a game, just begging to have his feathers You plucked. needed a bankroll to cheat someone, and you didn't care how you got it. That's irresponsible, Timothy. I know I'm unreliable and crazy. And downright crooked. Now, I've squared it away with the police. The money's being returned. And you're leaving here first thing in the morning. Where's Mac? Your good friend? <laughs> I saw him at the railroad station with his bag. He's smarter than you, Timothy. He's gone. I promise. I, I won't do anything like this again. Well, I hope so. But ever since we were kids together, you've left a trail of broken promises ten miles long. Now, brother, you are going to do it my way. What way is that? I'm afraid just taking you as far as New York isn't far enough. I mean, have you any idea what this would do to Father if he ever found out that his son was almost jailed for passing a bum check? And I wouldn't like him to find that out. Well, I guarantee you, he's not going to. I'll straighten out, I promise. Well, I'm not waiting for that. You're going to do as I say, or I'll take you down to headquarters right now, tell them I've changed my mind, and let them throw the book at you. The next morning, I got a nurse from the hospital to come in and take care of Father. Told my assistant I'd be gone for a few days and to keep the store running, and I brought Timothy down to New York. I had a friend there an exporter of American watches who needed a representative in England. Now, the idea of going to London appealed to Timothy. He had no trouble in talking himself into the job and agreed to go to London with a full case of samples at 15% commission on all sales. I remained with Timothy in New York until the boat sailed. Well, there goes the all ashore signal. Edwin, thanks a lot for everything. I promise you I'm turning over a brand new leaf and become an honest man. Well, I hope so. And I know Father will be pleased as anything when I tell him you've got yourself a good job. Now, you take good care of him, will you, Edwin? And I'll do my part. I, I promise you I'll never again hold a deck of cards in my hand. Now, don't make any promises you can't keep. I can. I can. Uh, wait, wait, over there. By the lifeboats, isn't that... It's McGuire. Who? Oh, uh, Mr. McGuire. Uh, Mr. McGuire, will you come over here? Why, of all people, Timothy. What are you doing on this ship? Well, I'm going to London. Uh... Now, isn't that a coincidence? So am I. Timothy, you lied. You had no intention of going straight, did you? Are you going to London also, Edwin? Now that you mention it, Mr. McGuire, that may not be such a bad idea. Yes, yeah, so I'll go and find the purser to see if I can share a cabin with my dear brother. Edwin, are you going to nursemaid me across the Atlantic all the way to London? It's a toss-up between that, Timothy, or my informing the police that you're on board. It takes a bit of doing to expose one's brother in the hope you can cure him, save him from himself. A brother is a friend given by nature, to quote the old saying... Let us hope Timothy will believe Edwin is his friend. Or is Timothy's willfulness and crooked bent uncurable? I dread to find out, but find out we shall when I return with Act Three. Oh, where are we? Oh, yes. Standing beside Inspector John Hilliard in front of a display in Scotland Yard of evidence relating to crimes unsolved. In his hand is a letter, perhaps the key to a mystery that has plagued the Yard for years. Three passengers disappeared from the Manchester Express one day, leaving only a corpse behind them and not enough clues for a solution. The word evidence derives from the Latin meaning to see more. Perhaps this letter the inspector is reading will enable him to see more. Gentlemen of Scotland Yard, if I have gone into some detail, it is because I want you to understand the predicament I was in. The ship sailed, and I, I shared, shared the cabin, cabin with, with my, my brother. brother. But as the days went on, I realized my hands were tied. Timothy had decided on the easy way, the wrong way to riches, and, well, he thought me a sanctimonious fool. Are 
Are you going to follow me all over the world, St. Edwin? Watch over me as if I were a child? Surely you must feel just a little bit idiotic. I'll tell you what I feel. I feel ashamed. I thank the Lord Mother's not with us any longer, and that Father need never know what his favorite son turned out to be. Now, if your lecture is over, I'd like to join some friends in the salon. Oh, Timothy, listen, please. Look, here's Mother's little Bible, remember? The one she used to take to church. Yes, I remember. Oh, for her sake, give it up, this, this life of yours. You still can. Put your hand on Mother's Bible and... And this time, promise. Mac is waiting for me. I'd like to go now. You have a good job in London. You're a good salesman. I'm not cut out to be a salesman. Father was, you are, but not me. Why did you take this job? Why not? The old fool paid my passage. I always wanted to travel the Atlantic on a steamship. Mac said we could clean up from Block Island to Southampton. I couldn't give up. Somehow, I, I had to make Timothy see the air of his ways. In the ship's salon, I found him and that McGuire playing poker with two passengers. Two, two lambs about, about to, to be, be fleeced. fleeced. I knew that if I didn't warn them, I was no better than an accomplice. Gentlemen of Scotland Yard, as I walked over to the table, I kept saying to myself, this is the right thing to do. I'm not being a Judas betraying my brother. I'm saving him while there is still time. Hello, Edwin. Gentlemen, may I interrupt this game for a moment? No, you may not. Go away. We're playing and we do not wish to be disturbed. Your dear Timothy. Please, Edwin. Will you go away? Now, don't make a nuisance of yourself. Timothy, will you get your brother out of uh, here? This gentleman is Mac McGuire. Have you been introduced? You see, Mr. McGuire is one of the most notorious card sharpers in the United States. Prove it, you meddlesome idiot. Oh, I'd be glad to. I'll sue you for slander. Will somebody fetch a captain? Uh, Mr. McGuire, if you will turn up your right sleeve to the shoulder, well, we'll go on. Don't you wish to sue me for slander? Well, go on, Timothy. Don't stop dealing the cards on my account. Why, gentlemen, look what we have here. Indeed, what have I picked up from my brother's lap? Well, do you know what this round little mirror is, gentlemen? Give that back to me. Oh, certainly, Timothy, take it. Well, gentlemen, let, let me tell you how it works. One sits back a bit from the table, lays the mirror face up on the lap, and as you deal... Aha! Why, you can see the face of every card you give your adversary. You see, one can learn a great deal about card sharping if one's brother is in the business. I'm getting out of here. The game's over, gentlemen. As I write this letter so many years later, I recall that Timothy was very quiet and reserved as we arrived in London. I installed him in a flat, and he seemed quite shaken by the scandal aboard ship. Or so I thought. He started the rounds of selling his American watches... And I was delighted he appeared to enjoy his work. It seemed to me he'd turned the corner. And I decided I could safely return to Rochester. I went along to the steamship line, purchased my ticket, and returned to the flat. Well, who just walked in the door if it isn't Brother Edwin? McGuire. What are you doing here? He's helping me pack, can't you see? Where are you going, Timothy, and why? Well, it's rather a long story, dear brother, and we don't have the time to tell it. A little problem has presented itself, so we thought this might be a good time to go up north and enjoy the country air. Have you been up to your old tricks with McGuire again? I thought you promised me that you would... We met purely by accident and just happened to get into a little game at the railroad hotel. Stupid loud mouth, all that shouting just because one of them bent down to tie his shoelace and found an extra ace on the floor. Hurry up, Timothy. Trains wait for no man. Tim's not leaving here. If he's broken the law, it's about time he paid for it. I'm locking this door. Give me that key, Brother Edwin. Now don't be silly. Take your hands off me. Give me that key. came too. McGuire and Timothy were gone. I thought I'd 
heard Timothy say something about the Manchester Express. I pulled myself together and hailed a cab to Houston Station. The Express had not yet left. I promised myself I'd go all the way to Manchester, find my brother, and do everything in my power to get him back on the straight and narrow. I found a compartment at the smoking inn, got inside, lit up a cigar, and waited for the train to leave. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I was looking for an unoccupied compartment for this gentleman and lady. There's a man smoking in there. No, no, that won't do. The lady cannot abide smoking. Find us another one. It was McGuire, disguised. And standing behind him in a long cape was Timothy, made up to look like a woman. A wig and a black veil down his face. His disguise, complete with ladies' parasol, didn't fool me for a moment. When we stopped at Mammoth to take on mail, I quickly changed compartments. Well, there were no corridors between compartments like on American trains. The doors opened only to the platform. But nobody saw me. I should have locked our compartment door. Didn't I tell you, Timothy? Brother Edwin would find his way in here. Well, how's your jaw? Timothy, for heaven's sake, listen to me. I've been listening to you all my life. Preach, preach, preach. That's all I've ever heard. Oh, look at you. Wearing those ridiculous curls, a veil, pretending to be a woman. I had to wear all this. How do you think I could get by the cops? It's good, isn't it? Oh, Timothy, please come to your senses. Are you going to spend all your life cheating and running? Haven't you got more pride? What's happened to you? Oh, do I have to sit here the whole way to Manchester listening to this Boy Scout brother of yours? I'm not talking to you, McGuire. Well, that suits me fine. Just don't cross me. Oh, come on, Mac. You don't have to threaten anybody. He means well. It's just the way he is. You don't see yourself at all, do you, Timothy? The conductor's been around to punch tickets, so I'm taking this stuff off. I'll shove the wig and the veil and the cape into the Gladstone. Where will I put the parasol? Timothy, you can't go on like this for the rest of your life, stealing people's money and having to skip town. I like this kind of life. There's excitement to it. Oh, you're so stupid, you don't even see that you're being used. Why don't you go run a Sunday school, brother Edwin? Don't listen to him, Timothy. I'm not. I can't breathe this stuff here with you two. What are you doing? Opening this window. Getting some fresh air. Give me that bag. What are you doing? There it goes. Out the window. What did you throw the bag out for? It's got all my costumes in it, everything. If nothing but disguises stands between you and jail, when we get to Manchester, to jail you'll go. Listen, you, he's my partner. You're not going to bully him. If prison's the only way to keep you out of Timothy's life, I'll make sure he gets there. You see this, Brother Edwin? Mac, don't do that. Put that gun away. I'd like you to leave this compartment right now. He can't get out now. The train's moving too fast. Just jump out the window after the bag. You know something, McGuire? You're crazy. Oh. Oh. I made a jump for McGuire's gun. And it went off, hitting Timothy right in the heart. He fell to the floor. We stood there, horrified. I knelt down and listened. He was dead. At that moment, the train started to slow down. Why, I don't know. McGuire saw his chance to escape, opened the compartment door and jumped. I jumped right after him. He wasn't going to get away from me. The two of us rolled down the embankment. And then I blacked out. When I came to, McGuire was mopping my head where it was cut with a handkerchief. I couldn't leave you out here alone, Brother Edwin. Oh. Oh, my. My head. You stop bleeding now. Oh, I don't understand you. Why aren't you a dozen miles away? Well, now, I couldn't run off with you lying here at the bottom of this embankment. You... You shot Timothy. You had a hand in it. The gun wouldn't have gone off if you hadn't jumped me. Oh, good Lord, forgive me, so I did. My head's clearing now. Well, you crashed right into that rock. Oh, why are you still here, McGuire? 
You should have run away while I was unconscious. Oh, I couldn't do that. I'm a gambler, not a murderer. <laughs> you could have bled to death. Oh, and that would have made everything so simple for you. Oh. You don't know me at all. The blood of the both of you on my hands in one day. I know you cared for Timothy. But so did I. Maybe by your standards, it was a funny way of showing it. But we didn't mean any harm. We only played men who had money to throw away. I think of Timothy right now. Lying there in that compartment on that train. Alone. Dead. And then I should have... Oh, that I should be the cause of it. Uh, it was my gun. We were both the cause of it. I ask myself... Shall I give myself up? I'm ready to. This way, I don't think I'll ever... I'll ever get over his death. How else could I pay for it? But if we do, everyone will know. It'll all come out about him. The news will certainly get back to America. Father will hear of it. It could finish him. And if we each go our own way... And, and not ever tell anyone. We'll be punished every day we see the sunshine. Yes, and that may be the greater punishment. There you have it, gentlemen of Scotland Yard. I've come to the end of this letter. From being an avenger of crime, I had become a conspirator against justice. McGuire got out of the country... I went to Cairo, I think. And I returned to Rochester. And unless your methods have changed in the past five years, inspectors, whatever you found on my brother's body, maybe even the Gladstone bag of clothes if some tramp didn't make off with it, everything, everything you, you found, found is probably at this very moment in your display cabinet of crimes unsolved. My father passed away six months ago in peace, never knowing what both his sons had done. I have one favor to ask of you. If you have in your possession a pocket Bible, it was my mother's. May I have it back? It's of no use or evidence to anyone but me. Here is my address. Dr. John Hilliard unlocked Scotland Yard's cabinet of the unsolved and withdrew a small pocket Bible. In its place, he pinned the letter he had been reading. Though the case of the Manchester Express murder was technically solved, it could never be called closed. I shall return shortly. up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother? And he answered, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? That is a question for all of us to answer in many ways. Are we our brother's keeper? I think we all are. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Bob Caliban, Lloyd Batista, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. The man in that picture, is he your husband? Yes. Bob, well, uh, perhaps you'd be interested to see a picture of my husband, Mrs. Reynolds. I, I believe I have one here in my... Hers. Well, yes, yes, here. Jack. You are. But it's not possible. I think I will take that drink after all. This is impossible. Oh, a very interesting turn, isn't it? As one of the characters in our novels might say, I came here expecting to find a plagiarist, and instead, we've uncovered a bigamist. I can't believe it. It must be a question of mistaken identity. I think that the only question, Mrs. Reynolds, is, now that we know the truth, 
What are we going to do about it? Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.